within the next 50 years, we are going to have an impact. Probably, hopefully, not globally threatening but certainly one of the size that could take out a major city. It is a battle between the bugs and man, and bugs are winning the battle right now. They're becoming resistant to everything that we use against them. It appears that we really are losing the battle. Every human society ahead of ours in the past has failed for one reason or another. Every human society has collapsed. They've all crashed. Now, is ours going to crash too? Ett nytt årtusende står för dörren och då vaknar domedagsprofeterna. Allt sedan tidernas början tycks någon någonstans alltid ha sigat om att det snart är slut med oss. På 1600-talet förutsa biskopen i Armagh, James Usher, att världen skulle gå under år 1996. Men lika lite som tusentals andra undergångsprofetier har hans spådom gått i uppfyllelse. Domedagen utövar en märklig lockelse. Och över 1000 undergångsprofeter och deras anhängare håller konferens i Phoenix i Arizona. De diskuterar förändringar i jordskorpan, asteroidnedslag, rymdvarelser och indianernas gamla profetior. The prophecies as somebody came up to me and said that they wanted to hear about the prophecies. You are the prophecy. You know, the coming together of the peoples is part of the prophecy. The prophecy says that we are one. We can talk about the devastation of the earth and about how it's in balance because it's cyclical, it's happening again. And time is short. We don't have a lot of time. I've been reading everything I can, going to as many prophecy seminars as I can to be prepared because unless we know how to purify water, store food, grow things, we'll have a terrible time surviving once the disasters strike. I purchased two guns. So to help with my personal survivor, survival and uh, just trying to learn where the safe areas are. We were going to change the earth. The changes will be catastrophic. They will be very frightening for a lot of people. Det påstås här att Englands drottning har köpt upp enorma landområden i Colorado. Om den väntande katastrofen skulle inträffa skulle det brittiska imperiet flyttas dit. The ones that will stay after the earth changes are the ones that will rebuild. And we will have a millennium of peace. We need to understand we're in a process, and this whole idea of doomsday is a time concept. Uh, my own feeling is that we're in probabilities. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Anything can happen. But the outcome is ultimately going to be very positive. They're beings. They're here, and they picked up the threads of these teachings. I think a lot of them possibly are ETs taking up incarnation here. Okay, it sounds weird, but I believe that. Okay, it's possible. Okay, not only that, they've got people who possibly are walking the earth right now who, believe it or not, may have been disciples of Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that? All the world, major religions, the Mayans, Christian prophecies, the Hebrew, says that this is the time for the transformation of consciousness from a third dimensional into a fourth dimensional. It's also the change from the Piscean Age into the Aquarian Age. What a wonderful time to be living in! Man, this is terrific! Ja, domedagsindustrin har gyllene tider. Man slår mynt av människornas inneboende oro för framtiden och inför det kommande årtusendet är profetiorna fler än någonsin. Ibland ska de slå in vid ett bestämt datum. Ibland är tidsangivelsen ganska vag. En pyramidprofetia gäller september år 2001. En tidslinje inhuggen i Keopspyramiden påstås förutsäga en stor förändring i det mänskliga medvetandet. När den mest berömda av alla domedagsprofetior ska inträffa utsägs inte. 
Den finns i uppenbarelseboken som skrevs 90 år före Kristus. I slaget vid Armageddon besegras Satan och odjuret av Kristi efterföljare. För de troende är detta det sanna tusenårsriket som ska vara till nästa domedag. Den 22 december år 2012 är en ödesdag för Maya-indianerna. Då ska deras så kallade femte tidsålder ödeläggas av vatten, vind, jordbävningar eller eld. Hos Hopi-indianerna finns en profetia som kan slå in när som helst. Den 109 år gamle hövdingen Dan Ivehamma, en av de sista av Hopi-folkets äldste, har anförtrots de hemliga profetiorna. De påstås ha skänkts till Hopi-indianerna av skaparen med så för över tusen år sedan. En av dem består av en symbolisk ristning föreställande livets väg. Den övre linjen leder till kaos. De vitas väg, den nedre, är den rätta vägen tillbaka till skaparen. De här båda cirklarna symboliserar de båda världskrigen. Den tredje skulle kunna säga om ett krig som gör slut på alla krig innan världen går in i den nya femte tidsåldern. Nyligen publicerade Hopi-indianernas äldste profetiorna i en cirkulär skrivelse för att varna hela världen. Hövding Dan anser att vi bör ändra vårt levnadssätt eftersom den sista tidsåldern är nära. Juli 1999, då ska en av läkaren och astrologen Nostradamus dunkla profetior slå in. Han skrev ner dem i fyradiga dikter på 1500-talet. Krig ska råda och en skräckens konung ska komma ur skyn. Kan han ha menat en asteroid? Eller en bomb? Vad han än menat borde vi inte behöva vänta länge. En märklig förutsägelse för år 1998 här rör från den amerikanska helbregdagöraren och profeten Edgar Casey. För över 50 år sedan spådde han att en tidskapsel gömd under svingsen skulle avslöja sanningen om Atlantis och förebåda ankomsten av en stor invigd som ska guida oss genom de kommande tre årens naturkatastrofer. Casey trodde att naturkatastroferna skulle börja på 1960-talet för att kulminera vid sekelskiftet. Hans tankegångar har inspirerat bland andra Lori Adele Toys profetior som kulminerar år 2009. Prophecy is not prediction. Prophecy is instead this very heartfelt uh, communication that says you must change or otherwise these things may happen. And so at the, at the pivotal point of all the prophecy is choice. I Arizona har rörelsen I am America, jag är Amerika, sitt anspråkslösa högkvarter. Härifrån sprider de sitt budskap om de dramatiska förändringar som ska ske i världen de kommande fem åren. Här ritar de kartor över de förändringar som uppenbarats för Lori Toy av övernaturliga väsen som hon kallar återuppstånda mästare. De pratade om en meteor som skulle hitta någonstans i den Nevada desert. De sa att det skulle upptäcka alla de tektoniska platser här i Nordamerika. That we would have a series of earthquakes alongside the activation of the Ring of Fire, and that would cause the sinking of California. That there would be another devastating earthquake that would hit the Pacific Northwest in the United States, and that would sink the states of Washington and Oregon and leave the Cascade Mountains as a range of islands. We would see flooding everywhere. They spoke about that there would be global warming all over the entire planet, that we'd see the melting of both the North and the South Poles, that we would have a shifting of the poles, three distinct shifts, and that in the final shift, that it would actually be a shift in our consciousness, that it would cause us to change inside. Innan Lori gifte sig med Leonard Toy hade hon varit gift med en lantbrukare i Idaho och hade tre små barn. Men tolv år dessförinnan, när hon bara var 22, var hon med om ett ytterst egendomligt möte. I was working as an advertising salesperson for a weekly newspaper in Washington state 
and I was called to go pick up an ad. So I drove out to this health food store, opened the door, walked in, and the lady at the counter uh, pointed her finger at me, just like this, and said, you have work to do for Master St. Germain. And of course, I was quite startled by that, and a little shocked, and quite taken, and thinking I'd better get my ad and get out of here. And, and I said, well, tell me, who is Master St. Germain? And, and she said, come here, you know. And so I followed her through these uh, neatly tiered rows of vitamins, and uh, went into her back office. And on the wall was this huge picture of a man. And she says, this is the Comte de Master St. Germain. And I was quite startled when I saw that picture. I, I felt as if it was someone that I had known before. Lori blev så gripen att hon ägnade fem år åt att lära sig meditera. Saint Germain och tre andra återuppstånda mästare uppenbarade sig för henne i en märklig dröm som återkom gång på gång. That dream was a dream where I was greeted by four master teachers and they unrolled this map of the United States and they showed changes, earth changes that were going to happen to the United States. Because the children were so little at the time, I wasn't ready to become, quote unquote, a prophet and put a sandwich board on me and walk the street and say, the end is near, because that was not who I was. I was a farm wife. Um, I, I was more concerned with getting my laundry hung up and my peaches canned. Men drömmen kom tillbaka. Och när hon mediterade började mästarna tala genom henne. Hennes vänner såg det som att hon var synsk och spelade in de återuppståndna mästarnas märkliga berättelser. I remember the first time that they that they actually showed the map again. What we did is that we got our own map that was laminated and we worked with erasable pens so that we could pen in the coastlines and actually follow as they were showing the new coastlines of the United States and the West Coast and the East Coast. Lori blev rädd. Hon var så säker på att det hon fått se var sant att hon sålde sitt hus för att bekosta tryckningen av den första kartan som visade ett starkt förändrat USA. Hon tror att förändringarna redan har börjat och kommer att kulminera inom de närmsta tio åren. Nästa steg var att framställa en tredimensionell världskarta som ser illavarslande ut för oss i Sverige. In Europe the prophecies were equally devastating. Uh, they spoke about an earthquake that would hit Scandinavia and actually would sink areas of Sweden and Denmark. Uh, in England itself, Ireland is prophesied uh, to go underwater. We see that Scotland does remain, parts of uh, northern England also remain, but uh, areas, low-lying areas such as London are now all underwater. We see that France has broken apart into a series of small islands here. We see here uh, this little peninsula of land, which is Italy. New lands emerge off of Portugal here near Spain. Allt är inte kris och katastrof, men priset för den nya tidsåldern, New Age, tycks vara att halva jorden går under. Högt belägna platser som Sidona i norra Arizona utgör skyddade tillflyktsorter och städer av guld kommer att växa upp på den på nytt födda planeten. Alongside also the earth changes were the prophecies of the new times, the golden age, which they spoke a lot of. They spoke a lot of the universal brotherhood and sisterhood. They spoke a lot about the new technologies that earth would actually be renewed after it went through this purification, so to speak. If I gave you a date and said, this is not going to happen until uh, 2150, would you take any action? Would anyone else take any action? No one would. And the only thing that would happen is progressively things would become worse to where there would be no point of return. Today in this minute, there is a point of return. Today, we still have hope. På internet når deras budskap ut till miljoner människor. Genom sin hemsida har de fått 40 000 prenumeranter på videokassetter, cirkulär, böcker och kartor. Men tror Lori att profetierna verkligen kommer att slå in? I feel that there's a possibility these things could happen within my lifetime. Yes, I think they could. I think there's a very strong possibility. 
But uh, better yet, if they don't, that if we take heed and actually change the direction and the course that we're going, that we can actually create a better world for our children. Om vi gör något nu kan vi kanske förhindra jordens undergång till glädje för nästa generation. Men vi lär knappast kunna hindra rymdens asteroider från att döda allt liv i juli 1999. Det är nämligen vad somliga anser att Nostradamus har förutsagt. Rymden har inspirerat såväl diktare och konstnärer som vetenskapsmän. När vi ser upp mot stjärnhimlen tycker vi oss leva i ett välordnat universum där allt har sin bestämda plats och rör sig som ett väloljat urverk. Men den skenbara ordningen störs av kringirrande vandaler. Grupper av asteroider och kometer som redan ställt till med stor förödelse på jorden. Asteroids can creep up on us unawares. Uh, they can come from the direction of the sun, for example, a direction we can't look in with our telescopes, obviously, because the sky is too bright. And if a an asteroid did come from that direction, it may hit us without any warning at all. Asteroids are really off the scale uh, as far as devastation is concerned. There is no other natural phenomenon that we know of Uh, that can wreak as much havoc as an asteroid or comet impact. Månen har under årmiljonerna drabbats av många nedslag, oftast av mindre meteoriter. Men inte ens jorden har med sin skyddande atmosfär sluppit undan. Astronomer försöker räkna ut var och när ett ödesdigert nedslag skulle kunna inträffa. There's been a, a number of occasions that we've been hit before. Uh, the most recent that we're sure of is the 1930 Brazilian impact. Uh, before that, there was the Tunguska event in 1908, which leveled some thousand square kilometers of forest. That had an energy of something like 10 or 30 megatons. And going back still further, uh, uh, we, we see evidence for many smaller and sometimes even larger impacts. And particularly the most famous one would be the meteor crater in Arizona that left a crater one and a half kilometers across. And going back much further into time is the KT impact crater, which is a buried crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, some 200 kilometers across. And this was the impact which is associated with the final extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And clearly that had a very important role to play in the development and evolution of life on Earth. Without it, we wouldn't be here now. These very large impacts are, occur on the average around about every five or 10 or 30 million years. And although there is only a very small chance that one of these objects would be heading for us within our lifetime, sooner or later it will happen. And sooner or later this indeed will be the end of a technological civilization. Forskarna tror att det föremål som slog ner på jorden för 65 miljoner år sedan bara var 10 kilometer i diameter. Jämför det med London. 10 kilometer är vad det är mellan Buckingham Palace och observatoriet i Greenwich. Ett föremål som inte var större än så tog död på allt liv på halva vår planet. Det finns tusentals mindre asteroider obehagligt nära oss. The energy of such an impact of a one kilometer asteroid is a million times the energy that was used at Hiroshima in 1945. You don't need any training in nuclear warfare to have a feel for it, that a million times the energy at Hiroshima would be a terrible event that would destroy the Earth's atmosphere and thereby become a global event. And it has been studied in fair detail, and it is just uh, too terrible for, for words. And uh, billions of people would die, and society, of course, would be totally destroyed. And it would be an agonizing, very slow death. It's just a horrible thing. 
And so this is the first priority. We must find these objects and we must do it as soon as possible. Det är en kapplöpning med tiden. I Kitt Peak i Arizona och i många andra observatorier sitter astronomer och spanar efter asteroider som skulle kunna träffa jorden. De brukar kalla dem nära jorden föremål. Tom Gurrells har uppfunnit en helt ny teknik för att spåra asteroiderna. Och den här kvällen undersöker han tre föremål som han iakttagit natten innan. We know that there are 1700 one kilometer asteroids that could hit the earth sometime in their history. Any one of these could have a name on it and we don't know it. That's a challenge to the astronomers. So with the eye I'm looking for faint trails and extended objects like comets. The computer uh, is also doing that and is particularly looking for uh, brighter objects. This is the third scan. And now the objects will be marked, uh, the newly found objects. De markerade föremålen skulle vid någon tidpunkt kunna kollidera med jorden. They all uh, present a hazard even that fist size if it hit, hit a person or a cow there would have been death. So they all are very hazardous if they hit the earth. Most of these asteroids are in circular orbits, quite stable configuration in the asteroid belt, but there are so many of them that they collide among themselves. And these fragments can fly all over the place and then get under the gravitational action of Jupiter that can throw them to the inner parts of the solar system where, where the Earth is. And, and, and of course Mars can be hit and, and the Moon and Venus and Mercury and in fact even the Sun can be hit by these objects. Kometer rör sig snabbare och är mer svårförutsägbara än asteroider. De kan bokstavligen dyka upp ur tomma intet nästan utan förvarning. 1994 träffades Jupiter av fragment från en komet som hade upptäckts bara ett år tidigare. Det hade varit ute med oss om den hade varit på väg mot jorden istället. Hale bopp kometen sågs av miljoner människor våren 1997. Även den upptäcktes bara ett år tidigare. Därför måste vi hela tiden vara på vår vakt. Risken för ett nedslag är större än chansen att vinna på lotteri. I'm fairly relaxed and sanguine about the possibility of being hit by an asteroid or comet. They are after all uh, very low probability events, but very high consequence events. And that's completely the other way around from other risks that we're used to in everyday life. When you get in your car, for example, you're in a fairly high risk situation, but low consequence. Highly consequential for yourself if you die, of course, but low consequence for the world at large. Were an asteroid or comet uh, be found on a collision course right now, uh, there's frankly very little we could do about it. We have the technology to deal with this problem, but the first thing you have to realize is that the one thing we don't want to do is to break up the incoming object, to, to pulverize it. By doing that, we simply turn a cannonball into a cluster bomb. We end up with more problems than we started with. What we need to do is to push it out of the way, to modify its orbit slightly so it misses. For the future, there's no doubt in my mind that planetary defense, as it's become known, is going to become a major preoccupation. I det amerikanska försvarshögkvarteret Pentagon vill man försöka styra undan eller till och med spränga farliga asteroider. Jonathan Tate har tillsammans med några framstående vetenskapsmän bildat Space Guard UK för att i första hand varna för asteroiderna. Jonathan Tates barn, Doff och Becky, har skapat en hemsida på internet som når ut över hela världen. Asteroid. That is um, 
a little too big. Guess the message across. I know this too big. The aim of the Space Guard project is to develop, or at least to encourage, governments to develop a global surveillance system. The problem with this threat is that we can't yet totally quantify what the threat actually is. We need a surveillance system to work out or to find out how many threatening bodies there are out there. Det är just vad Tom Girls håller på med. För att få reda på när nästa asteroid eller komet som kan förgöra jorden ska dyka upp skulle det krävas sex teleskop för 500 miljoner kronor på olika håll i världen. Den årliga driften skulle gå på 100 miljoner. Men det är det få länder som är villiga att satsa. Well, government response so far has been lukewarm to say the least. We already know that we could do the whole project three times over for the amount they're going to spend on the Millennium Dome. There is a much publicised donation that the UK government has made to NEO Research through the European Space Agency. Sadly, if you do the sums, the total given by UK PLC to the global project is £5,928.57. We're talking about not just the survival of civilization, which is important, obviously, in its own right, but also the long-term survival of the human race, which, if nothing is done, if we don't step off the planet, putting it in those terms, we will simply be wiped out when the next large comet or asteroid hits the Earth within the next 30 million years. So in the long term, humanity is doomed unless it steps off the planet. And that's really the fundamental point. Here we are now, end of the 20th century, are exactly facing this watershed with the capability to do it. It's the only question is whether we have the willpower. I en framtid kanske mänskligheten kan utnyttja andra planeter för sin överlevnad. Men än så länge måste vi nöja oss med jorden. Och ändå framställer vi själva vapen som kan förgöra både oss och vår planet. Under det kalla krigets dagar rådde domedags stämning, men de styrande försökte lugna folk med praktiska tips om det värsta skulle inträffa. Det är två kinds av attack, med varning och utan varning. Söndags, holidays, vacation time, vi måste vara redo varje dag, all the time, att göra det rätt om den atomiska bomben exploderar. Duck and cover! Duck! De här goda råden fick den brittiska allmänheten. One idea is to make a lean-to of wood resting against an inside wall. Strong boards or doors taken from their hinges are quite good. Then cover the wood with bags or boxes filled with some heavy material like sand, earth, books or rolled up clothes. Inför hotet från asteroider, geografiska förändringar och andra naturkatastrofer har nya överlevnadsstrategier sett dagens ljus. Framförallt här i Texas, 35 mil från kusten. Om man får tro vissa domedagsprofeter kan det här böljande landskapet befinna sig på havets botten om några år. Den före detta miljonären Antonio Carducci tar hotet på fullt allvar. Han har satsat alla sina pengar på de här tekniskt avancerade betongbunkrarna. Han hoppas att de ska klara stormvindar på uppåt 100 sekundmeter. Dessutom har han lagt upp ett litet förråd med förnödenhet. This is the storage room and I did it especially for storage. I have no windows in here and just and just that door and I have the I have it off my bedroom especially so that the, for, for for security purposes. And in here I have 35 tons of canned food that I've canned myself including what I have out in the garage. And in addition to that I have some some tomato sauce because I've canned some spaghetti. 
principally I've canned rice and beans, about 12,000 pounds of rice and about 12,000 pounds of beans. I've got 10,000 pounds of, uh, of millet and 10,000 pounds of rye. I think I bought 20 or 30 cases of dried cheese. I bought uh, a lot of peanut butter and I've also bought uh, uh, tuna fish. And then I've got soap, ivory soap, and I've got detergent, laundry detergent. Antonio is 79 years old. Han kom till Texas för några år sedan från Florida där han tjänat en förmögenhet på fastighetsaffärer och aktier men förlorat det mesta. I Texas har han satsat alla sina återstående pengar i den här anläggningen i den fasta förvissningen om att svåra tider stundar. I personally am 100% sure that these, that, that these changes are going to happen. I can't, I, nobody can be sure of the severity of it. Nobody can be sure of exactly where the coastlines will be and what will come up and what will come down. But there is going to be there is going to be a cleansing of the earth. There is going to be there is going to be earth changes, and there certainly is. And the vibrations are going to ascend up into a higher vibration, which is called the fifth dimension. I'm certain that that's going to happen. Right? See, and it's kind of an exciting time. Antonio has studied Gordon Michael Scallion's book. Liksom Lori Toy och profeten Edgar Casey varnar Scallion för katastrofala förändringar i jordskorpan under de närmaste åren. Han fick reda på att förändringarna redan hade tagit sin början och skulle kulminera omkring 1990. I tidskriften Earth Changes Report påstår han att av de 64 katastrofer som förutspåtts för 1994 skulle 55 ha inträffat. En av dem var jordbävningen i Kalifornien. Men eh, han spådde också att San Francisco 1995 skulle ligga på havsbotten. Fast eh, det finns motmedel också, säger Antonio. The prophecies made for the United States are based on the energies that exist in the, in the United States at that time. See? And it's the same for England, it's the same for everybody. See? So, so when the, as the energies change, the prophecies change. See? And by energies I mean if we become more loving, more forgiving, more non-judgmental, more compassionate, right? See? We can balance the negative energy on this planet, our own self, by our own thoughts and actions and deeds, rather than letting it happen through earthquakes. And, and So we have a choice. The choice we have is between evolving into a spiritual society, which is the, which is the fifth dimensional society, or remaining indefinitely with a third dimensional material society. Those are the choices that we have to make. Antonio har valt en höjd utanför den lilla staden Wimille till sin tillflyktsort. When I first sold my apartment in Florida and headed out, I had no idea where I was going. I really headed out to look for a place and I wound up in Wimbley. And why I wound up in Wimbley, I really don't know. This is where I wound up. But I have since come to understand that Wimbley is a very very special place to God and that the energies, the consciousness, energies that that love is very very high in this area. See? And, and I've been here in Wimbley two years. Now, how long I will live in Wimbley is anybody's guess, you know, but I don't think I'll be here forever. I think, I think I have a, a, a purpose for being here. I'm here when that purpose, when I've said it, when I've fulfilled my reason for being here, I'm, I suppose I'll move on somewhere, you know. Men innan dess vill Antonio se till att det finns skyddsrum mot alla de familjer med barn som kommer att tvingas fly. I just have a message intuitively. I just wound up with it one day that the, the ch children will be needing help, that they can't take care of themselves. And families, while they're out foraging for food, can't drag little children around, one or two year old children. They'll need a place to put them, see? So that's what I think will happen here. And, as, and Scallion says there'll be five or six places throughout the United States where people will send their children to make sure they're safe, see? Well, somebody has to get them there. And I think that this will be this will be a stopping over place where people will bring their children. There'll be a group of people here who will do, do the work and take care of them and things like that. And these will be spiritual people, and we'll get these people, these children, to safety. And that's that, that's what this is all about, you know. This is a spare bedroom that I've made, and I made them especially uh, large bedrooms. I, I made uh, uh, three large bedrooms rather than. 
uh, four or five small bedrooms because it's a lot easier to accommodate children in large bedrooms. You know, we'll probably be over packed with children. They'll, they'll be coming from everywhere. And I'm anticipating that. And for that reason, I bought a dozen sleeping bags because I feel, feel as though the people who are actually taking care of the children won't have a place to sleep inside here. We'll have to sleep outside in, on the ground somewhere. There will be people showing up here who form a, become a committee for taking care of the children. They'll know what to do. They'll be, be intuitively knowledgeable about what to do. And they'll take over and they'll manage the whole business. My, my, I think that by, when that time comes, my, my, my job will be done. Byggnaderna och förråden med mat och 20 000 liter gasol har kostat Antonio en kvarts miljon dollar. Han har till och med skaffat en flygel från Japan för att underhålla sina gäster. Man frågar sig om det inte känns lite ensamt att sitta här och vänta på domedagen. I don't feel lonely because well I have an awful lot of physical time on my hands. My mind is occupied. My mind is 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 severely occupied with the earth changes that are coming with my responsibilities with you know and for the past five years I have been working on a program to get closer and closer to God, and I do that by affirmations. Each night, before I go to sleep at night, night I, I make certain affirmations, you know, an affirmation that I am something, you know. There's a list of affirmations that I make, but I always end it with that, that uh, every day in every way, I know God more, I understand God more, I love God more, and I serve God more. And those affirmations, I've, I've been making now for about five years, and they just work. Även om nu Antonio kan känna sig trygg i sin betongbunker med sin gudstro kan det säkert hända att andra grips av panik och försöker tränga sig på. I bought some guns, but I haven't even bought some any ammunition yet. I don't know how much to buy. I'm going to buy a little bit of ammunition, mostly to, to, to fire some shots, to, to sort of as a warning or to scare somebody. But, but there are those risks and I'm prepared to take them. See? But I just believe that I believe I'll have help on the etheric level. For, for, for the safety that I need. After all, I'm, I've taken a, a sworn oath to surrender my ego to God's will, see? And, and, and God will not forsake me. I'm just sure of that, you know? You know. God does not forsake his friends. You don't forsake your friends, right? God does not forsake his friends. Men varken Guds tro eller betong hjälper säkert mot smittsamma sjukdomar. De senaste 20 åren har över 30 nya, mycket smittsamma sjukdomar dykt upp världen över. Och när vi går in i det nya årtusendet tycks ännu fler sjukdomsalstrande bakterier vara på väg. Well, Smittsamma sjukdomar har alltid varit den vanligaste av alla dödsorsaker. Men med hjälp av nya vacciner och antibiotika tycks människan ha varit på god väg att besegra sjukdomarna. När Sir Alexander Fleming upptäckte penicillinet innebar det ett verkligt genombrott. Thousands of men, thanks to penicillin and plasma, will come home to their thankful families. The whole world of peace to come will reap the benefits of this great wartime medical discovery. Science has won another victory over death. Men redan Fleming insåg att smittämnena skulle bli resistenta mot den nya mirakelmedicinen. Och det är just vad som håller på att hända. Many felt that the advent of effective antibiotics and vaccines for the common childhood infections had meant that in sense the era of infectious disease mortality and morbidity was over. Well in part that was a very narrow view of the problem because if you look out of the developed world into the developing world where the majority of the population is, infectious disease has remained the leading cause of human mortality, much greater than human conflict or non-infectious problems. Now, if you ask today in the developed world, you will find a change in view because the AIDS pandemic highlighted how vulnerable the world's population is to new serious pathogens. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. 
So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. Det var över tio år sedan. Nu är 30 miljoner människor HIV-positiva. Frågan är vad vi kan göra åt det. We have now tools to look at how the virus changes inside an individual patient. And the rate of change has staggered everybody. Um, there may be in a, a patient who is in full stages of disease, something like 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 11th viral particles. And that means that you're essentially generating a new organism every day. So the pace of evolution is staggering. And that presents all sorts of problems in the development of drugs and vaccines. And the fast pace of evolution of HIV has been the major reason why we don't have an HIV vaccine. Or it's taken 10 or 11 years to produce combinations of drugs that can handle the virus's evolution. Nya sjukdomar dyker ständigt upp. 1994 chockades världen av rapporter om en ny smittsam sjukdom i Sair som ledde till döden inom två veckor. Smittan kom från Ebola-viruset. We knew that Ebola was a new disease. The virus had been isolated and it was a virus which had never been seen before. We knew that it was a very fatal disease because we had heard from missionaries who were operating the hospital where the epidemic occurred that it had killed many, many people. So when we went to the outbreak site, we were very careful to treat these patients with respect. Heyman och hans team lyckades spåra smitthärden. Orsaken var den skriande bristen på vårdresurser. Den gången hejdades epidemin, men nya farsorter kan dyka upp när som helst, var som helst. It is a battle, it's a constant battle, and I think it's not being overly gloomy to say that it's a battle that's whose pace is accelerating. If you look globally, there are two patterns of human behavior and the structure of our societies in the world that are causes for concern in terms of pathogen evolution. Evolution occurs most rapidly when population density of the pathogen is greatest. Population density of the pathogen is greatest when the host population it uses as an environment is at the highest density. So the first of these factors is the growth of what are called megacities in the world. These are cities over the size of about 8 million. Now in the next 20 years, the number of megacities in the world is predicted to double. It is in these very high density communities around the edges of megacities, a classic example is Rio de Janeiro, where one's likely to see the emergence of new infections, whether bacterial or viral, and their rapid spread because of large population density, poor health care, poor sanitation. So that's the first factor. The second factor, which I believe is very, very important, is of course our global mixing habits. Infectious diseases spread because of travel. Today we can travel very rapidly. I can be here in London this morning and tomorrow morning I can be in the center of Africa. With me I could take an infection that could infect Africans, maybe an infection that they don't recognize because they've not had before, and I could cause an epidemic in Africa. Or I could take an organism that's resistant to an antibiotic and infect Africans with that. When I return, the same is true. I could come back with an organism which I was, with which I was infected in Central Africa and bring it back into the United Kingdom. Det gör det internationella samarbetet ännu viktigare. Man måste på ett tidigt stadium kunna slå larm och sätta in alla resurser för att begränsa epidemier och ta fram läkemedel mot nya sjukdomar. Men den medicinska och farmakologiska expertisen kämpar ofta förgäves mot bakteriestammar och virus som snabbt blir resistenta. Det är en ond cirkel. It's not nature striking back, it's the process of natural selection in operation. Um, if we apply a selective pressure like mass immunization of our children against the measles virus, 
that provides an enormous selective pressure on that virus to change so that it can escape the attentions of the vaccine. And that's not premeditated thought by the virus, that's the struggle for the survival of the fittest. It's Darwin's notion of natural selection. It is a battle between the bugs and man, and, and bugs are, are winning the battle right now. They survive by developing resistance to what man has developed to treat them. And so there's a constant battle, which at present the microbes appear to be winning. 1995 dog 17 miljoner människor i olika epidemier. Vissa sjukdomar tycks dyka upp ur tomma intet, andra gör comeback. Det är de som utgör det verkligt stora hotet. De är på stark frammarsch. Det är inte vid Harmageddons laget om mänskligheten utkämpas utan på teknikens och forskningens fält. Men vad är då domedagsprofeternas förkunnelse värd? These prophets of doom and disaster uh, are mostly exaggerating very slim or negligible evidence. They have no real proof of that anything like that will happen. And I think what they're appealing to is the general public's great need for certainty. They love certainty. It helps them through their lives. And of course, they turn to religion for it. Now, it's not the job of scientists to be certain about anything. In fact, our profession requires us always to know that our theories can never be certain and uh, that they will be superseded. And uh, so, when you ask scientists about to make predictions into the future, I think if they're good ones, they will be most uncertain and not be able to tell you what will really happen. Peddling in disasters is uh, not something that we need to, need to get worried about, but it is something we need to think about. And I think we've not thought about it nearly enough. And with our greater knowledge now of what's happened in the past, we should now bend our minds to this issue. Every human society ahead of ours in the past has failed for one reason or another. Every human society has collapsed. Now, is ours going to crash too? The statistical possibilities are that it will, or at least it will change. And I think we want to be on the, on the winning side. If it is going to change, we want to be the people who do the changing. We don't want to find ourselves being hit on the back of the head as on treading on a garden rake, as happened, has happened every single time before in the past to a human civilization. Det som skiljer vår kultur från alla tidigare är de härskaror av forskare och tekniker som gör allt för att rädda oss. I have strong views on technology, or at least on people's understanding of it. It's pretty well ethically neutral. You can have very good technology, which is no threat whatsoever to us or to the Earth. And I think into that category comes much of the information revolution. I, I would guess that technology has equal chances of being our doom or our salvation. And I don't know. Nobody knows. It depends how we use it. Vår tids mest avancerade teknologi då? Vad är det? Jo, datatekniken. När vi lyfter champagneglasen för att fira det nya årtusendet kan ett nytt dödligt virus släppas loss. Alla datorer styrs av en intern klocka, men för att spara minnesutrymme i de första datorerna angavs årtalet bara med två siffror istället för fyra. För datorn betyder 99 år 1999. När år 2000 rings in vid midnatt slår klockan om till 00. Det är bara det att datorn vet inte vilket århundrade det är. Det kan resultera i kaos som påverkar alla aspekter av vår tillvaro, från charterresor till pensioner. Det kommer att kosta 12 000 miljarder kronor att rätta till det. Hinner vi göra det i tid? Eller kommer vår högteknologiska kultur att få ett snöpligt slut i samma ögonblick som det nya årtusendet rings in? Det får tiden utvisa.